Hello, I am Annie Mazes and I handle all adult library marketing at Workman Publishing. Welcome to our midwinter 2021 book buzz. You can reach me at this email address, amazes at workman.com, and please follow along on our social channels. I'm going to start with some recent and imminent faves. Recent and imminent faves. The Fortunate Ones is for fans of Ann Patchett and Kevin Wilson. The Fortunate Ones is an engrossing story of class and love and loyalty. And Kirkus has starred a review called Tarkington, a gifted storyteller, and this novel, an impressive literary balancing act that entertains as it enriches. At the Edge of the Hate is the winner of the 2019 Penn Bellwether Prize for Socially Engaged Fiction. It deals with homelessness in San Francisco and it is incredibly eye-opening. Ivy Pakoda calls it a deep, dark, and necessary look into the lives often discarded and disregarded. Made in China is a real call to action to think about where the products that we purchase come from. It deals with an SOS letter that was found by a labor camp worker in China. Amelia Peng went on a massive investigation to pull back the curtain on these Chinese labor camps and to really track where the goods and services that we get here in the States come from. On Fragile Waves, Lily Yu follows up her science fiction and fantasy short fiction, including the Hugo Locus and Nebula nominated and astounding award-winning The Cartographer Wasps and the Anarchist Bees with an evocative and heart lacerating debut novel. Essential fiction to understand our world, Yu will draw in new fans while continuing to intrigue those who have read her for years. That is all from the Library Journal Start Review. Big Girl Small Town has received three star reviews. It's told in a highly original voice for fans of Dairy Girls or The Milkman, Sally Rooney, and Otesha Mashvig. And In Case You Get Hit by a Bus is an incredibly useful and important book, a simple, easy to follow program for organizing everything you're in your life from Netflix passwords to finances for a calmer life now and to make things easier in the event that you are not around. Let's get back to the party is a debut novel. Sebastian Mote and Oscar Burnham are 30-somethings who come of age after the AIDS crisis, but before the current era where they might have had a more comfort of an out adolescence. Sebastian is a very straight-laced suburban high school teacher. Um, his very calm lifestyle is threatened by the appearance of Arthur Ayer, a gay student who is so comfortable in his own skin that Sebastian finds himself increasingly obsessed with this teenager. Oscar is furious and defiant in the face of what he sees as the death of queer culture. And he begins a relationship with a once eminent novelist who had been known for graphic stories of pre-AIDS hedonism. These are told, this book is told in alternating points of view from Oscar and Sebastian, and it recounts their mirrored struggles with generational envy, cultural identity, and the traumas of history. It is an incredibly intimate and complex look at gay life. Citing fascinating studies on sports fandom, Larry Olmsted, the author of Real Food, Fake Food, makes a case that the more you identify with a sports team, the better your social, psychological, and physical health will be, the more meaningful your relationships are, and the more connected and happy you feel. Fans maintain better cognitive processing as they age, they have better language skills, and on a societal level, bonding over sports events helps heal after tragedies, providing hope where we need it most. As this global pandemic sidelines teams and fans are sorely aware of what they are missing, the book fans reminds us why we love games so much. Misadventure. Jess Phoenix is pretty amazing. Is a volcanologist, natural hazards expert. She's the founder of Blueprint Earth, and she has dedicated her life to scientific exploration and making science accessible for everyone. Her career path, hard earned in the still very male dominated world of science, has shoved her headlong into deep sea submersibles, uh, congressional races, glittering cocktail parties, and numerous pairs of work boots. It's also inspired her to devote her life to making it science more inclusive. Uh, Ms. Adventure is her story that blends personal memoir with daring adventure and scientific journey from jungles to glaciers, university classrooms to television studios, and even to the side of the world's largest volcano where she fixes a flat tire with a ballpoint pen, gum, and duct tape. Readers will love this unbelievable adventure in science all embarked on for the love that Jess has. 
The Nature of Oaks is by Doug Tallamy, the New York Times bestselling author of Nature's Best Hope and Bringing Nature Home. And in this book, he reveals the ecological importance of the mighty oak tree by following the trees from month to month, highlighting the seasonal cycles of life, death, and renewal. He also shares practical advice on how to plant and care for an oak tree, along with information about the oak species for your area. It will inspire you to treasure these trees and to act and nurture and protect them. Why We Cook is a beautiful book that explores the, um, the intersection of food and feminism. Artist Lindsay Gardner brings together stories, essays, kitchen profiles, interviews, and more featuring 112 women, uh, restaurateurs, food producers, activist writers, professional chefs, personal chefs, and home cooks, all of whom are dedicated not only to their craft, but to changing the world of food. There are profiles on change makers, like Christina Martinez, a chef who immigrated from Mexico and brings her Philadelphia community together through food while using her platform to champion immigrants' rights. There's Leah Penniman, who describes a day in her life on Soul Fire Farm, uh, which she co-founded to combat racism in the food system. This book is filled with beautiful Waller Cutler illustrations from Lindsay Gardner. Um, and it really brings together the voices revealing the power of food to uplift and nourish. And it reveals complex questions and how they want to affect change and offers us the opportunity to learn about them as well as ourselves. Silence is a sense. A young woman sits alone in her apartment in an unnamed English city, absorbed in watching the comings and goings of her neighbors through her window. She's been traumatized into muteness after a long devastating trip from Syria to the UK, and she believes that she really just wants to sink deeper into isolation. At the same time, she begins writing for a magazine under the pseudonym The Voiceless, trying to explain the refugee experience without sensationalizing it. Gradually, as the boundaries of her world expand and as an anti-Muslim hate crime shatters the members of a nearby mosque, she has to make a choice. Will she remain a voiceless observer or become an active participant in her own life and her community? This is Kuwaiti American author Leila Alamar's US debut and she incorporates her expertise in Arab women's literature and PTSD into the story of a refugee's personal journey to investigate both how her protagonist suffers but is also able to heal. Good thinking. In a world where cries of fake news and mistrust of experts often hold sway, we can be misled very easily. In Good Thinking, physicist David Robert Grimes helps identify seductive but destructive bad logic. Grimes dismantles dangerous conspiracy theories and common misconceptions. The book doesn't just focus on the misinformation of today, it also includes famous examples from the past, going beyond just a relaying of the science and current events and providing a much richer sense of how illogical thinking has persisted throughout time and across the world, Packed with fascinating characters from a murderous pope to a superstitious pigeon, good thinking can help us fight willful ignorance and plain old irrationality in all forms. Liberty by Caitlin Greenwich. Very excited for this book. Caitlin is the author of We Love You, Charlie Freeman. And this book is just gonna knock your socks off. Coming of age as a freeborn black girl in reconstruction era Brooklyn, Liberty Sampson is all too aware that her mother who is based on one of the first black women physicians um, has a vision for their future together. She wants Liberty to go to school, become a doctor, practice alongside her, but Liberty loves the arts and she doesn't really love science. And she is very aware of the fact that while her mother is able to pass um, because of the color of her skin, Liberty did not have that luxury. So one day she is offered a proposal of marriage from a young man from Haiti who promises that he will, she will be his equal on his island. And so she jumps at this opportunity and he whisks her away to Haiti and she discovers that this is not the case. She is still subservient to men. His family hates her and does not hear her voice. And so she really struggles with where she might find freedom and what freedom actually means for a black woman, for herself and for generations to come. I did not know who Richard Thompson was when I first heard about Bee's Wing. Um, subsequently, I listened to some of his music and it makes sense that he has been named one of the top 20 guitarists of all time by Rolling Stones uh, magazine. Known for his brilliant songwriting, his extraordinary guitar playing and his haunting and lovely songs, Richard Thompson has garnered a long time cult following. 
This is his first memoir, and it chronicles the start of his legendary career from the pivotal years of 1967 to 1975. He matured into a major musician during this time, establishing the genre of British folk rock with the era-defining band Fairport Convention. He left that soon after to create a duo act with his wife, Linda, at the height of the band's popularity. His discovery and ultimate embrace of Sufism profoundly reshaped his approach to everything in his life, including his music. In this intimate memoir, Thompson recreates the spirit of the 60s as he found and then lost and then found his way again and takes us inside life on the road in the UK and the US as he tours with some of the most legendary bands of all time, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, Jimi Hendrix, and more. Spicing cling with butterflies. Outdoor educator and field researcher, Sarah Dykeman decided to do something no one had ever done before, pedal along with the monarch butterflies over the entire length of their 10,201 mile migratory journey. She did it alone on a handmade bike through three countries. In Bicycling with Butterflies, Dykeman recounts her incredible journey and the adventurous ups and downs of her ride. She weaves the tale full of humility and grace, all while sharing the science that underlies the urgency of saving the monarchs and why we all should care. Bicycling with Butterflies definitely combines memoir, travel, and popular science and is a must-read debut if you are looking for an uplifting story filled with optimism, energy, and hope. Hot Stew is the second book from the author of Elmet, which was shortlisted for the Booker Prize. This novel tells the story of an unlikely group of individuals in contemporary London from the top echelons of society down to the bottom. All are in some way connected to a building in Soho whose mysterious owner, Agatha, wants to convert it into condos and luxury shops. The problem is that the building houses a brothel and Precious and Tabitha, two of the women who live and work there, are not planning to go quietly. The fight over this piece of property draws in the men who visit, including Robert, a one-time member of a far-right group, Jackie, a policewoman intent on making London a safer place for all women, and a collection of vagabonds who inhabit the basement. Funny, smart, and with a fascinating cast of characters, Hot Stew cuts to the heart of some of the biggest issues faced today, questions about property and ownership, wealth and inheritance, gender and power. Folklore by Angela Herr. Elsa Park is a physicist at the top of her game, stationed in an international observatory in Antarctica, thousands of miles from the ghosts that have literally haunted her family her entire life. But even the South Pole can't prevent her childhood imaginary friend from finding her. The reappearance of this ghostly apparition signals that the curse her mother told her afflicted the women of their line who were doomed to repeat the narrative lives of their ancestors from Korean folklore and whose story Elsa has tried desperately to outrun. It's finally catching up with her. When tragedy strikes, Elsa must return to the childhood home and cultural lore she rejected in favor of ambition and hard science. There she grapples with a splintered family as she seeks long elusive answers in the handwritten pages of her mother's dark folk tales. Obviously very healthy dose of magical realism in this incredible own voices novel. The Stone Road is a haunting lyrical fantasy set in the harsh world of grit and monsters. Casement Rise is a dusty town and Jean is a young girl with an innocent but timeless voice the day Jean was born, a mysterious force named Furnace awoke a few miles out of town and it mysteriously calls people to it, never to be heard from again. Jean's father has been called to it, as has so many others. And this novel revolves around Jean and her relationships with her stern and overprotective grandmother and the ancient evil that is Furnace. <clears throat> Jean's grandmother has always kept Casement rise safe from monsters, but in protecting Jean, she may have left it too late to teach her how to face the demons on her own. And now it is time to grow up. With the lyrical cadence of the last unicorn and intense imagery of Wizard of Earthsea, The Stone Road is a powerful novel about hope and belonging. Something very different. The Secret World of Weather. Every cloud, every drop of temperature, every sunbeam conveys a secret message. And if you know what to look for, this book will tell you how to find it. The Secret World of Weather, a natural navigator, Tristan Gooley, author of The Lost Art of Reading Nature Signs, turns his signature brand of close observation to the weather. Gooley goes beyond the forecast to change your very idea of what weather is. The weather doesn't just blanket an area, it changes as you walk through it. You'll discover distinct microclimates on opposite sides of a tree and even beneath a blade of grass. 
By reading the weather, we begin to understand how it shapes our cities, woods, hills, and you'll never see your surroundings the same again. How we do family. There are a few resources that give LGBTQ parents examples to follow as they move through the obstacles of starting and raising a family, and this book will help fill that need. In 2017, Tristan Reese, who is transgender and his groundbreaking pregnancy attracted media fanfare. But prior to that, when he was just a year into a relationship with Biff, who is now his husband, the couple learned that this niece and nephew were about to be removed from their home by Child Protective Services. Immediately, Tristan and Biff took in one-year-old Healy and three-year-old Lucas, and as you can see, they are much older now, becoming caregivers overnight to tiny survivors of abuse and neglect. From this surprising start, Tristan and Biff built a loving marriage and a very happy home, learning to parent on the job. They adopted Haley and Lucas and soon decided to grow their family biologically, and along came Leo in 2017. In How We Do Family, Tristan shares their unique story and what he's learned about being the best parent, partner, and person you can be. Through crisis, adoption, pregnancy, and all of the usual challenges of parenting, Tristan shows that more important things than getting things right is doing them with lots of love. No recipe? No problem. Author Phyllis Good of Fix It and Forget It is here to help. No Recipe, No Problem offers tips, tricks, and inspiration for improvising in the kitchen. Each chapter offers practical kitchen and cooking advice from an overview of essential tools and pantry items to keep on hand to how to combine flavors and find good substitute ingredients. Freestyle cooking charts provide scaffolding of building a finished dish from what cooks have available. Kitchen cheat sheets lend guidance on preparing meats, vegetables, and grains with correct cooking times and temperatures. And Stories from Good Cooking Circle of Friends offers personal experience and techniques for successfully improvising for delicious results. Beautiful photographs throughout. This will be a cookbook to grab any night of the week. Set in 1960s, the world teeters on the edge of cultural, political, sexual, and artistic revolution. On the Greek island of Hydra, a community of poets, painters, and musicians revel in dreams at the feet of their unofficial leaders, the writers Charmian Clift and George Johnston, troubled king and queen of Bohemia. At the center of the circle of misfit artists are the captivating and inscrutable Axel Jensen, his magnetic wife Marion, and the young Canadian ingenue poet named Leonard Cohen. When 18 year old Erica stumbles into the world, she is fresh off the boat from London with nothing but a bundle of blank notebooks and a burning desire to leave home in the wake of her mother's death. Among these artists, she will find an unraveling utopia where everything is tested. A theater for dreamers is intoxicating and immersive. It's a spellbinding tour de force about the beauty between naivete and cruelty, chaos and utopia, and about the wars waged between men and women and the battlegrounds of genius. Polly Sampson is married to David Gilmour of Pink Floyd, and she has written lyrics for their songs. Uh, she and David have produced the audiobook edition of this book, which contains original music by David and will be published by Workman uh, so alongside the print version. Um, a good time to mention that Workman is now in the audiobook game. We have started producing our own audiobooks this past June, so look for those wherever you get your audiobooks. Proof of Life. For the past 20 years, Daniel Levin has worked with governments and development institutions worldwide, as well as engaging in diplomacy and mediation efforts in war zones. So when he received a call from an acquaintance with an urgent cryptic request to meet in Paris and learn that a young man had gone missing in Syria, he was actually able to help in a way that governments, embassies, and intelligence agencies would not. Over 20 tense days, Levin uses his extensive contacts to chase leads through the Middle East, meeting with powerful sheiks, drug lords, sex traffickers in pursuit of this truth. In Proof of Life, Levin dives deep into a shadowy world where few have access. He offers a fascinating study of how people use leverage to get what they want from one another and where no one does a favor without wanting something in return. Proof of Life is a fast paced thriller wrapped in a memoir, a must read for anyone interested in power dynamics, international affairs, the Middle East, or our growing number of forever wars. Legends of the North Cascades comes from library favorite Jonathan Evison. David Cartwright has had enough. After three tours in Iraq, he's come home to Washington State only to find that he feels incapable of connecting with the people and the place that wants to find him. Most days, his love for his seven-year-old daughter, Bella, is the only thing keeping him going. When tragedy strikes, Dave makes a very dramatic decision. He will take Bella to live in a cave in the wilderness of the North Cascades. So begins a compelling adventure 
a novel of a father and a daughter attempting to cope with the breathtaking but harsh environment. Once they're settled in the cave, Bella retreats into a different world, that of a mother and son who had lived in the very same cave but thousands of years before at the end of the last ice age. As the two dramas begin to merge, a timeless odyssey unfolds, both as a mediation on the perils of isolation and an exploration of humans' indelible struggle to survive. This is perfect for readers of Peter Heller's novels or Kristen Hanna's The Great Alone. It is a return to sweeping multi-character narrative like his New York Times bestseller, West of Here, and is a very satisfying read. Nowhere Girl is crazy fascinating. Quote, by the age of nine, I will have lived in more than six a dozen countries on five continents under six assumed identities. I'll know how to document is forged, how to withstand an interrogation, and most important, how to disappear. So this book is wild, heart-wrenching, and unexpectedly funny. It's an inspiring coming-of-age memoir about running for freedom against the odds. To the young Cheryl Diamond, life felt like one big adventure, whether she was hurtling down the Himalayas in a rickety car or mingling with underworld fixers, her family appeared to be an unbreakable gang. One day they were in Australia, the next South Africa, the pattern repeating as they crossed continents, changed identities and erased their pasts. What Diamond did not know was that she had been born into a family of outlaws fleeing from the highest international law enforcement agencies, a family with secrets that would eventually catch up with them. By the time she was in her teens, Diamond had lived dozens of lives and lives, but she grew love and trust turned to fear and violence and her family, the only people she had in the entire world began to unravel. She started to realize that her life itself was one big con and the people she loved the most dangerous of all. With no way out and her identity burned so often that she had no proof that she even existed, all that was left was a girl from nowhere. Surviving would require her to escape and to do so, Diamond would have to learn, unlearn all the rules that she grew up. Like the glass castle and catch me if you can, Nowhere Girl is an impossible to believe true story of self-discovery and triumph. If you don't follow Jessamine Stanley on Instagram, I highly recommend that you do so. She is the proudly fat black queer yoga teacher and charismatic author of Everybody Yoga who drops a lot more F-bombs than namastes and refuses to pray at the church of Lululemon. In Yoke, she takes us on a personal and provocative journey into what it means to practice yoga. For every yoga buddy yoga taught us how to do yoga, Yoke tells us why. In Yoke, what draws its name from the literal translation of the Sanskrit root yuj, Y-U-J, from which the word yoga derives, Jasmine writes about what she calls the yoga of the everyday, a yoga that is not just about poses, but about applying the hard lessons we learn on the mat to the even harder daily project of living. This yoga of the everyday is about finding within life's toughest moments the same flexibility, strength, grounding energy, and core awareness found in a handstand or cobra pose. In a series of deeply honest, funny, gritty, thoughtful, and largely autobiographical essays, yoga explores issues of self-love, body positivity, race, sex, and sexuality, cannabis, and more, all through the lens of an authentic yoga practice. The Temple House Vanishing. At Temple House, nothing is ever as it seems. Louisa is the new brilliant scholarship student, finding most of the other students at the all-girls Catholic boarding school as icy and unfamiliar as the drafty mansion. She forms a fierce bond with the intense and compelling Victoria, an outlier and student provocateur. Their close bond is soon unsettled by the young charismatic art teacher, Mr. Lavelle, igniting tension and obsession in the cloistered world of the school. Then, one day, Louisa and Mr. Lavelle disappear. There's no trace of either one. It's the unsolved mystery that captivates the whole country. Year after year, the media revisit it and the conspiracy theories persist. Now on the 25th anniversary, a journalist, a woman who grew up on the same street as Louisa, delves into the past to write a series of articles and uncover the truth. She finds stories of jealousy and revenge, power and class, but will she find Louisa and Mr. Lavelle as well? Because remember, at Temple House, nothing is ever as it seems. Told through alternating points of view, Rachel Donahue's debut novel lets the reader into the hearts and minds of both Louisa and the determined reporter. This page turner is perfect for fans of Elizabeth Turner's Catherine House or Kate Elizabeth Russell's My Dark Vanessa. The case of the murderous Dr. Cream is fascinating. 
In the span of 15 years, Dr. Thomas Neal Cream poisoned at least 10 women in the United States, Britain, and Canada, a death toll with almost no precedence. Structured around Cream's London murder trial in 1891, when he was finally brought to justice, the case of murderous Dr. Cream exposes the blind trust given to medical practitioners, as well as the flawed detection methods, bungled investigations, corrupt officials, and stifling morality of Victorian society that allowed Cream to prey on vulnerable and desperate women many of whom had turned to him for medical help. Dean Job vividly recreates this largely forgotten historical account against the backdrop of the birth of modern policing and newly adopted forensic methods. But then most police departments could hardly imagine that serial killers existed. The term was even unknown at the time. As the Chicago Tribune wrote then, crimes, cream's crimes, <laughs> pardon me, marked the emergence of a new breed of killer one who operated without motive or remorse, who murdered simply for the sake of murder. FYI, if you're a fan of the podcast, My Perfect Murder, episode 199 is about Dr. Cream. And finally, my last title today is The Last Nomad. When Shugri Saeed Sal was six years old, she was sent to live with her nomadic grandmother in the desert away from the city of Mogadishu, Somalia. Leaving behind her house, her parents, her brothers, multiple wives, and her many her father's multiple wives and her many siblings, she would become the last of her family to learn a once common way of life. The desert held many risks from drought and hunger to the threat of predators, but it also held beauty, innovation, and centuries of tradition. Shugri grew to love the freedom of roaming with her goats and the feeling of community and learning the courtship rituals, cooking songs, and poems of her people. In time, Shugri would return to live with her siblings in the city, Ultimately, the family was forced to flee as refugees in the face of the civil war, first to Kenya, then to Canada, and then ultimately to the United States. There, Trigui would again find herself a nomad in a strange land, learning to navigate everything from escalators to homeless shelters to marriage, parenthood, and nursing school. And she would approach each step of her journey with resilience and a liveliness that is all her own. At once dramatic and witty, the last nomad tells a story of tradition, change, and hope. Thank you so much for joining me. I know that was a lot to get through and I really appreciate your time. I hope you are enjoying your midwinter conference and I hope you take care. Thank you so much.